They say that you die three times. First, when your body stops functioning. Second, when you're buried. And third is when your name is spoken for the last time. Can the same be said for a town? If that's the case, the town of Griffin, North Dakota has already suffered its first two deaths and is on the verge of suffering its third, final death. We're looking at a town that's so poorly documented, so forgotten, and so wiped out that its story, without exaggeration, is a step away from being lost forever. Hopefully, with the help of this documentary, we can change that. So basically, you're going to be finding out about this town in this video, as I do. Some information about Griffin can be found online, but only a few words. To really uncover what's out there, we're digging into the archives of the Pioneer Trails Regional Museum in Bowman, North Dakota, to see what we can learn about those who lived there, and then visiting the ruins themselves to see firsthand what remains, if anything. This is the story of Griffin, North Dakota. The griffin that we see today little resembles the town that once stood in this spot. The main road is still there, crossing the still active 1907 railroad tracks, as is the beautiful Atkinson Schoolhouse, which we'll be exploring in detail shortly, uncovering some interesting things about its evolution through the years. But aside from that, griffin doesn't even look like an old town. The buildings that once stood here are gone, having left no visible trace. They were wooden framed, typical of the American frontier, and had no foundations that we would be able to spot today. I could only find one map of the town dated 1917 that laid out the town's roads and plots of land, but only marked off a handful of buildings that had been developed by that point. The structures today don't follow any of the old 1917 town site plan, and even the schoolhouse, has been moved. As we explore Griffin today, we're going to be telling the story of two completely different settlements, the Griffin that was and the Griffin that is, and there's very little overlap. We came into town from Montana, following the old Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Paul, and Pacific Railroad, better known as the Milwaukee Road, which is going to play a key role in this story. As we drove, we took in the rolling hills and prairies along the way. And met some of the locals. The ruins of Griffin were quiet and unassuming. A spot on the side of the road that one might not even notice as they drove by. Griffin wasn't always the name of the town. The settlement was originally started in the 1890s by a man named William Atkinson, affectionately known locally as One-Eyed Bill, who established a ranch on this spot years before the railroad coming through here was even a thought. He soon established a grocery store and a saloon, making it a center for commerce for homesteaders in the area. The saloon hosted square dances year-round, and Griffin soon became the area's social center too. Stories tell of heavy blizzards coming through the area, but these square dances being held just the same, even becoming a fun place to take shelter from the elements. The town grew slowly, with a lumber yard, wool merchant, and creamery, as well as a post office for Atkinson as early as 1900, but it was in 1907 when things really began to take off. Bowman County was established, which now contained Atkinson, and Atkinson and the nearby settlement of Twin Buttes were the two leading contenders for the Bowman County seat. Twin Buttes eventually won out and was renamed Bowman. 
a survey team for the Milwaukee Road, specifically the Chicago, Milwaukee, and Puget Sound subsidiary, came through the area around 1905, mapping out this portion of a long rail line that would travel from the Missouri River to the Pacific Coast. Atkinson would be a stopover, where the railroad would build basic maintenance outbuildings, a water tower, grain elevators, and a station. However, instead of calling the station Atkinson, the railroad decided that the name Griffin would be more appropriate after Henry T. Griffin, who had been the assistant general passenger agent for the Milwaukee Road since 1900. It was in 1906 when the first work on the railroad began, grading out the track bed, followed by the rails finally being laid. This section of tracks was mostly built by convicts and chain gangs and Chinese construction workers. The first recorded train pulled into the Griffin Station in 1907. With the railroad came a boom in business and communication within the town, and having the town be called Atkinson, and yet the station being called Griffin, was confusing. And in February 1908, the Atkinson Post Office was renamed the Griffin Post Office, officially changing the name of the whole town. The one thing in town to maintain the old Atkinson name was the schoolhouse. Today, the Atkinson Schoolhouse is one of the few remaining early structures left in Griffin, standing right next to Main Street and beside an old Milwaukee Road boxcar. But this isn't the original location of the schoolhouse. So jumping back a little bit, the first white settler of the township was a Norwegian man named Albert Anderson. And as he divided up his land later in life, he sectioned off two acres and donated them for use as a consolidated school for all communities in the area, including those in Griffin, at the time still called Atkinson. Thus, the Atkinson School was built, and it was located two miles northwest of the town. As it wasn't exclusive to Griffin, it didn't need to be in downtown Griffin, and it was located on the land chosen by Anderson. The school's foundation was still at the original site until early 2023 when it was removed for farming, but the wooden structure itself has been moved down to Griffin proper. In fact, at the original school site, you can still see the outline of the school ground, the two acres that Mr. Anderson initially donated. Because of the two mile journey from Atkinson, and because of how many of the kids spread across the township were attending, the Atkinson school had a fleet of three mule carts known as buses, each with their own driver. One of these bus drivers was a fellow named Ulla Smittesong. He was an immigrant from Norway who traveled to the US with his family in 1904, eventually making his way out to Bowman County, settling in Griffin, and he may in fact have been the kindest man in town. In 1918, the influenza epidemic struck the town with so much of the population falling ill. School remained in session and Ula continued his wagon route, starting off earlier than normal. As he arrived at the different homes to pick up the children, he would often stay to take care of household chores that the families who were ill could no longer manage. At the end of the school day, he did the same for afternoon chores at each of the homes, charitably helping out every family that needed it along his route for several weeks. Sadly, it wasn't long until he himself became sick, and he was taken to a makeshift hospital in nearby Rame, where he died three days later, leaving behind two kids and a wife, only a few weeks pregnant with his daughter Olga. Griffin itself survived the epidemic, with the population slowly recovering. Even at this point, the old schoolhouse still held on to the original Atkinson name. Let's explore inside the schoolhouse as a storm rolls in on the horizon to the west. built up and is sagging. So we're gonna really wanna be careful going through here. 
door is still on its hinges, but most of the door is gone. There's the door, by the way. Man, there's lots of owl pellets in here. Mm -hmm. The school also doubled as the area's church. There were attempts to build a dedicated Lutheran church, but they never materialized. Most services held in this building were likely held by a Reverend Wangberg. This style of graffiti is in several places throughout the town. It's here in the school, and it's over on some of the barns on the other side of town, on some of the sheds. I generally dislike graffiti. It breaks the historical feel of the site, and it is vandalism, but at least this is better than a whole bunch of swear words or just vanity tags. Hey, what's pretty cool about this is because that has fallen away, you can actually see an old roof in there, which means this was the schoolhouse initially. And then they built this addition onto it. The school was originally built with only two rooms, but as enrollments reached around 90 students, an addition was built onto it. Some of these rooms were also subdivided. The attic is large enough that someone standing in the center would be able to stand upright. So the school had ample room for overhead storage. And you can see the electrical wiring running through the ceiling. Chances are, where the modern-day ladder stands in the corner of the room, there probably was an access panel and wooden ladder back when the school was in use. The old section of the building still has the original wooden shingles. Thanks to this area being exposed, we can distinctly see where the original schoolhouse ends and where the addition begins. While there's no firm date as to when the addition was built, it must have been within only the first few years of its operation, because the historical photograph of the schoolhouse taken sometime after 1912 already shows the massive addition. Here, we can see one of the larger heavy doors. These would have been mounted on here. I don't know what would have been in the middle if the whole thing would have been doors and able to open up into one giant shared classroom, or if it was just a door on either side and then some sort of a fake wall, I don't know. The first teacher's name was Mrs. Swift, and the school had literally dozens of other teachers over the following years. The last teacher here was a Mrs. Margie McGee in 1947 and with the closing of the school year came the closing of the school itself. The classrooms are now empty, the school bells silent, and the floor slowly collapsing beneath the one remaining desk. But this building was once full of happiness and laughter. The former students looked back fondly and in the 1960s and 70s wrote down their recollections, remembering baseball games, sledding, and pranks in the classroom. Rest in peace, Graham, 1930 to 2021. Oh, look at that, blinds. Made by Luther O. Draper of Spiceland, Indiana. There you go, Luther, bring in the spice. Oh, what's that? Open, half, and shut. It's the draft and the check. So it's it's the airflow for the, the heater. Possibly for a fire extinguisher. Naturally, that is long gone. Hey, check this out. You can see the original chalkboards. I remember coming across chalkboards like this in the ghost town of Metropolis in Nevada. 
you can still see fragments of the chalkboard on the very iconic schoolhouse there. The school was moved from its remote site two miles north to actual Griffin proper in the 1960s. There were plans to refurbish and repurpose the building, but they fell through. Griffin was only one of the towns that utilized the Atkinson Schoolhouse. For much of that time, the population of the town itself was lower than the number of students attending the school, due to all of the nearby communities sending their children. Griffin's population grew over the years thanks, in part, to the railroad coming through. That wasn't all, though. In 1912, America's first transcontinental automobile highway came right through Griffin and was connecting Boston, Massachusetts to Seattle, Washington, and along the way, connecting to the Yellowstone National Park around the middle. This new highway, which in this area was a mere two-lane dirt road, was bringing travelers from both coasts and everywhere in between. By this time, Griffin's heyday, the town boasted its post office, two stores, two lumber yards, a restaurant, a saloon, and what was known as a blind pig, essentially a pool and billiards hall which moonlighted as a gambling casino. One funny story of note took place just outside of that blind pig. The cowboys in town had been talking up how fast their horses were, and they decided to make wagers and race. While they were getting ready, one of the cowboys tied a bandage around his horse's legs, and then bet on it. Everyone was more than happy to accept this bet, laughing at the injured horse, thinking it was lame, and when the pistol shot signaled the start of the race, he and his horse darted ahead, taking first place. Even in the 1910s and 20s, the frontier was still a rough and wild place. The Griffin Saloon had been shot up a few times, and fights often broke out between cowboys and railroad workers. During the World Wars, the railroad rumbled with troop and supply trains, but now the tracks see only a couple of trains a day, and they never stop here. The 1960s and 70s were hard on the Milwaukee Road Railway, with the company filing for bankruptcy in 1977. Chances are this boxcar was abandoned on one of Griffin's two railroad sidings, which no longer exist, and was eventually commandeered as a storage shed, probably by the same people hoping to restore the old schoolhouse. Sheesh, it is just all oil and definitely not fumes I want to be breathing in. It's a beautiful car. I'm glad somebody got at least a little bit of use out of it. The grain elevator here is the last remaining structure that hints at the station and depot that once thrived. The grain elevators themselves were brought in in pieces by railroad and assembled here on the site, with half of the town's men being employed in the construction. Nah. Jeez. <laughs> okay. Griffin once had three of these elevators the first one coming in in 1910, and a second arriving within the next couple of years. Those are now long gone. The grain elevator that stands today was the last to be built, and the largest, and as you can see by the condition, it was in use to some capacity until at least recently. I couldn't find any trace of the other railroad buildings that once stood, they were simple wooden structures, and were either burned or taken away for use elsewhere. In 1930, Griffin's population peaked at 67 residents, but that very same year the town's post office closed its doors, and Griffin's fate as a ghost town was sealed. The population slowly began to drop as people moved on to opportunities elsewhere. The drought of 1936 further pushed people to move out of Griffin. 
Most of the hundreds of plots that were laid out for the hopeful future of the town had never been occupied, and today, the streets and avenues crisscrossing the town site have been plowed over to make way for farming. Before we move on to the later structures in the site, let's take a look at the buildings that may date all the way back to the height of Griffin. On the other side of Highway 12, the main road through the area, is a single ranch home. Back in the day, this land belonged to someone named Albion Houston, and today it's still private property. Respecting that, the only footage that I got of the structure was from the road but I could see a beautiful old wagon in front with a skull inside. Back in Griffin, this pile of dried lumber was once another early structure, and satellite images show that it was standing until around 2009. It's right in the center of what was once First Avenue, so chances are it was moved over the years for one reason or another. Old artifacts like lighting and personal effects are still scattered throughout the ruin. This photograph of the Main Street Railroad crossing was taken well into Griffin's decline, perhaps in the 1960s, and shows a large white barn-type building. This building has been gone for at least 25 years, but it had a concrete cellar beneath it. That cellar remains today, caving in and flooded out. The barn may actually have been built on top of a pre-existing cellar from a previous structure, and that cellar might date back to the 1920s. A home built on top of another concrete cellar still stands just to the south of the first cellar. There's a whole bunch of birds flying out of this thing. I don't want to disturb any. Aside from the schoolhouse, this is probably the building in best shape on the town site, but given how precariously it is sitting on those flimsy stilts over a flooded basement, this building's days are numbered. The whole structure is sagging in the middle, and I'm sorry, but there's no way that I'm going inside to explore it. We can see this building as well in the railroad crossing photograph, revealing that it once had an enclosed front porch. In the 1980s, the town had six families living on the site. This trailer was brought into Griffin during the town's decline, and even though it didn't have anything to do with the town's early history, it was one of the more interesting structures to explore. It's a Pathfinder mobile home built in the 1950s or 60s in Wisconsin, and may have been here in Griffin ever since. The decor is distinctly 50s through 70s, and the only hint to the former resident's identity that I could find was an old World War II era officer's garment bag. This might be post-war. Lieutenant R. A. B. McIntosh. Looking at it closer later, I believe it said R. R. B. instead. Well, it's not in the worst shape I've seen one of these. I think I own one that's in worse shape. Sheesh. Despite the name, I couldn't find any records of this man. The living space also contained the kitchen, still with the oven and stove. Then I moved back into the home along the side hallway, adorned with a discolored puzzle on the wall. The first room I came to was a bedroom with a hanging light fixture and collapsed ceiling. Next came the bathroom, complete with that distinct pink 1960s tub and toilet.
The master bedroom beyond, like the rest of the trailer, is rapidly deteriorating. Another mobile home sits perpendicular to Main Street. This one is in far worse condition. This trailer was such a mess that I couldn't even enter it. A portion of the roof has collapsed and the walls are beginning to splay outward. It appears that sometime around the 60s and 70s, the town site was used for farming, with three grain bins for feeding livestock. One structure that may have been a bit older was this long hen house, or what looks like a hen house and is made of wood. The wood looks older than the site itself, so this may have been moved here from another location. This is just full of old kitchen equipment. Pots, pans, jars. I probably could have gotten inside, but somebody didn't want me to. Wow! Jeez! Bro! Oh, I see. He's just protecting his nest. Okay, alright. I'm sure there would have been some neat items to see if I'd have been able to get deeper. I did, however, find this cassette tape in the debris. Memory... section? While I usually don't remove items from sites like this, curiosity got the better of me. I'm gonna play it. I'm gonna take this home. I'm gonna digitize it if I can. If it contained any unique information or recordings, it would be especially important to preserve it. Your addresses are different in any way. Dock in space D for the question. This is a test of speed and accuracy. We will allow you exactly six minutes to do as many of the 100 examples as possible in the allotted time. Get your pencil ready. Begin now. Later, I played the tape, but it was some sort of memory training tape and nothing of historical importance. An outhouse beginning to tip over. Aw, two holes. Two friends. Hey. Oh, I don't want to step out onto that. But there's a magazine up there. If we can get the date on that, we might have an idea of when this was abandoned. That is old. Well, no, it's more of a catalog. Alright, so there's no date on this, but... This looks... 60s? It's a Sears catalog! It occurred to me later that these magazines might not be in the outhouse for reading material, but instead they may have served a far more practical purpose. Old wooden work sheds were scattered around the site. One seems to have been a small workshop. The ice cream box was of particular interest. I couldn't find much information on the brand, but chances are, it's a local ice cream brand from the nearby town of Bowman. The other shed was for gardening, still full of old terracotta pots, as well as jars of strange substances.
then I came to this mystery. I have no idea what this odd installation is. This is a very bizarre structure. I can't identify what it is. After filming this, I've shown pictures of it to friends, including one who has a ranch in the area, asking if this looked familiar, and we couldn't find any definitive answer as to what this is. The wooden pegs seem to have been for insulation, so wires may have been strung along this, but that sure would have been a lot of electricity. In a stable nearby, hundreds more of these beams are stacked. Interestingly, some of the posts are numbered. What exactly were these? And why did the previous operation need so many of them? If you have any idea, please leave a comment below. I'm thinking this might have been a barn or a stable. And when people moved out of here, they took everything except the posts. Lastly, towering above it all was a steel windmill, still catching the strong prairie breeze as it whips across the Midwest. This is a monitor windmill from Evansville, Wisconsin. At the western edge of town, along what was once Second Avenue, the railroad ties from the two sidings were stacked neatly into piles. There were also piles of sheet metal, Something tells me that this is what remains of the town's first two grain elevators. Beyond the piles is a scrapyard of junked automobiles. I didn't take a close look at them, but satellite images show that these cars have been sitting here since at least the 1990s. There isn't much more to say about Griffin. Sure, it was never a massive settlement, but it was full of life and stories that deserve to be remembered. The Milwaukee Road played such a vital role in the story of Griffin, taking it from just a small trading post known as Atkinson to becoming a brief stopover on the western stretch of the mighty railroad. It's fitting that the following day we coincidentally stumbled upon a community museum two states away, working to keep the story of the Milwaukee Road alive. This is the Milwaukee Road Heritage Center in Montevideo, Minnesota. The museum features several trains, a model railroad, and a 90-foot turntable. If you're in the area, it's worth stopping in to see the hard work these enthusiasts are putting into keeping the legacy alive. But two states away, Griffin just one of hundreds of towns along the Milwaukee Road, is scratched from the maps and faded away from even local memory. As the town falls away into the past, the feeling can be summed up well by the words of Mert Buckley, one of the local ranch foremans in the early Atkinson days in the 1890s. Quote, I don't regret my age in the least for I was born early enough to enjoy a sort of freedom that no American will ever know again. A special thank you to the Pioneer Trails Regional Museum in Bowman, North Dakota for helping me with the research on this one. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to my channel and consider joining my Patreon at the link in the description below. As always, a special thanks to my supporters on Patreon, especially Marlo Perez, Kelly Black, Kaiser Wilhelm II, Kaiser Friedrich III, Zach Richards, Donald Anderson, Cody Henricks, Joan Haynes, Sean Kimball, Glenn Bittescombe, Stephen Schwankertz, Gabriel Colomb, RGB, Tara Mullicar, Keith Holland, Rob M., Amos Mayhew, Corey Andrews, Nicholas Masella, Cole Tannock, Sophie Baber, Rob, Oliver Chin Chen, John Maluski, David Watipka, Tiffany Raritan, R -M, Mad Time Media, Nathan Gutierrez, Max Metcalf, David Littlejohn, Sean Sahi Frazier, Nikki Chan 92, Corbin McDonald, Matthew Burns, Goblin of the Salt Plains, Luke Stevens, Gordon Robbins, Aaron Stark, Troy Wentworth, Clarkey, Sam Forker, Busy B, Christopher Rosendale, Road Weary, Kitty Bits, Taniel 38, Kenzo Buick, 
Brian Reedy, Eden Cleefish, Bless Moles, Coda Yoda 16, Carol Adams, Clay Hobbs, Steve Valley, Gojira's Trains, JC Hobbs, High Treason, and The Pepper Milk.